You went online to switch your car insurance to Progressive so you could save money. But then you saw a friend request from an old summer camp buddy. And now here you are, clicking through photos of his kickball team from 2011. Hmm, looks like they won the championship that year. Then he moved to Tulsa. Oh, a new tattoo. Yes, they said it was easy to save hundreds on car insurance with Progressive, but they forgot about the rest of the Internet. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and affiliates. National average savings by new customer surveyed who saved in 2019. Hamilton, yet another easy victory, a sublime drive. He had to nail it at the start, and he did. Although Mercedes did spice things up in the end with cryptic radio messages asking him to up his pace, but a wonderful victory for Lewis Hamilton and Mercedes yet again. Hello everyone. Yes, we've had an absolutely amazing race at Monza. And in fact, we were so excited after the race that we just couldn't wait to record this episode of the Inside Line <laughs> F1 podcast. We're a day ahead of schedule. Yes, indeed. <laughs> but what a lovely race it was. And given Hamilton's absolute series of wins this year, 2015, we had a very interesting statistic come up on Lewis Hamilton given to us by the virtual stat man on Twitter. It goes like yes. this. Ayrton Senna, 161 starts, 41 wins, and 80 podiums. Lewis Hamilton, 160 starts, 40 wins, and 81 podium. Kunal, can you do the math for me? My God. My so, God. absolutely hats off to Lewis Hamilton. This is officially the Hamilton era. Yes, it is. And since you asked... I have done the math. If Lewis Hamilton wins in Singapore, which he is expected to, Correct. he will actually have better statistics than Ayrton Senna. Wow. So one race away. Yes. And he's been unbeatable inside and outside of his team. And like Bernie Ecclestone said, Lewis Hamilton is the perfect world champion for the sport of Formula One. Couldn't agree more. Though personally, Lewis Hamilton's... Titles are of utmost importance to the Inside Line F1 podcast, Kunal. <laughs> so it's not just on track that his performance is blistering. Because, you know, every time we have Lewis Hamilton in the title of the podcast, our podcast just has to cross 1500 listens for the week. <laughs> you so know, you'll, you'll notice I'm very generously using Lewis Hamilton every time I say a sentence in this podcast as well, because, you know, it doesn't hurt clearly. Yes, that's very well spotted. <laughs> Thank you, Lewis Hamilton, and thank you to our listeners as well. Who are all clearly Lewis Hamilton fans. Talking of Bernie, do you know one almost wondered if he'd actually called up Mercedes and asked them to spice up what was otherwise a pretty dull race hmm. by most standards? But as it turns out, it was not Bernie, it was the FIA. So firstly, let me correct you. I personally don't think it was an entirely dull race, to be honest. Raikkonen had a bot start and he made a climb up to the grid. There were midfield battles all around. Max Verstappen was there and we also had Marcus Ericsson join the fun for a change. And if I might also add, this was possibly one of the better exciting one-stopper races since a long time. Unless you are Sebastian Vettel in Spa. <laughs> yeah. And to go back on the FIA call-up. The pre-race tyre pressures for both Mercedes cars weren't up to the prescribed minimum recommended by Pirelli. So in effect, they were probably unsafe for usage and hence the call-up. Though as per the reports that I've read, Kunal, the pressures were actually measured pre-race. And then why was the need for a post-race call-up? I mean, if this was a safety issue as the FIA claims it was, why not just haul up the Mercedes cars mid-race? and bring them off track immediately. Mm -hmm. I mean, after all, the FIA is there to ensure adherence to rules and directives, especially safety-related rules. Yes, you know, uh, very interesting you said that. And I don't know why the FIA didn't act in real time like they otherwise do. Although, having said that, taking the cars off isn't really the solution, but trying to send some communication out to the team is. Okay, the other question, more so from a business side of uh, view on Formula 1, 
is that the race result would have gone from a win to a disqualification for the difference of a 0.3 PSI or pounds per square inch on Hamilton's cars. Now, to new fans, the technical complexity and the reality of Formula 1, especially this reality, sure. is extremely difficult to explain. And as we've seen, there are so many Lewis Hamilton fans there, Kunal, so try explaining this to them too. But now that Mercedes have actually been given a clean chit by the FIA, why don't you explain to our listeners what the issue was exactly? So, I'm going to simplify it and I'm going to use basic principles of physics, okay? So, we all know and hopefully we've all studied that heat expands and cold contract. So when Mercedes had their tire blankets on the cars on the starting grid, the air pressures were right as the heat caused the tire inside to expand. Okay, when the blankets were removed, the tires cooled down, hence the air contracted and the pressure dropped. Okay, so let's not complicate this further. (laughs) It was a controversial decision, so to say, to hand over a clean shit. Okay, but you know, The best way to also relate to this is this similar phenomena is seen in your road cars, tires as well. Wow, very interesting, I must say. A possible disqualification of Mercedes, though, would have been absolutely dreamy stuff for Ferrari. (laughs) I mean, imagine Vettel on the top step of the podium at Monza. I mean, could it have gotten any better for them? Absolutely not. Hmm, So the FIA could have actually given us a dream result, which was a Vettel in a Ferrari on the top step. Luckily, they didn't do so because Hamilton deserved the win. But what the FIA did do is that they gave out a record 168 grid penalties. 168 is ridiculous. The even more interesting part is that all these penalties were shared by Renault and Honda powered cars. Okay. And despite all these penalties, we had all drivers starting on the grid in Monza itself. I'm just happy that McLaren is creating records of some kind this year. (laughs) Talking of McLaren, the funniest was about Jensen Button. So he qualified 16th and he, of course, had a five-place grid penalty of his own. And after everyone else's penalties were applied, he ended up starting 15th, you know, which is utterly ridiculous in my (laughs) view. Okay, But to be frank, I see this penalty system sooner or later, I hope evolving into penalizing teams and drivers separately for mistakes made by them. You know, drivers facing grid penalties due to their team's inabilities doesn't make too much sense to me. I agree, but an unexpected beneficiary from the whole FI grid penalty madness, Marussia. So they started their cars 13th and 14th, which for them is a phenomenal (laughs) race start. So the slowest cars on the grid actually started in the midfield. But it seems that despite being the second year, the new formula is proving to be very difficult for the engine manufacturers. We had a Mercedes blowout for Nico Rosberg too, and a 100% reliability record for all Ferrari engines in Monza. The Tifosi power, I tell you. Yes, Tifosi power indeed. And we put up some really amazing post-race pictures of fans in Monza enjoying the podium celebrations. You know, Mithila, if you and I are ever going to watch a race together, it has to be Monza. (laughs) I vote for Monaco. But (laughs) anyway, believe it or not, we finally have some proof that the F1 fans love DRS. Our listeners should actually check out our images on our Facebook page, the Inside Line F1 podcast. (laughs) And yet again, this episode, there is so much to talk about. We're all over the place like McLaren Honda. Let's (laughs) stick to the notes from our debrief session. Sure, what's next? Let's talk about qualifying. That was a pretty awesome session as well. Yes, so Hamilton... Eased his way to pole. Rosberg in the older spec Mercedes engine was beaten by both the Ferraris. Is there anything else? Yes, of course. We had Max Verstappen and Toro Rosso's new cooling solution that was made public. Woohoo! <laughs> and you know, from all the chatter on social media, the best that I liked and I would like to pick and tell our listeners is that if F1 is fashion, Toro Rosso and Verstappen's engine cover blow up was actually a wardrobe malfunction. <laughs> I love that. And of course, the absence of Renault part cars in the top 10 of qualifying. And Honda too. Not that we or them actually hoped or expected them to be there. (laughs) But before we move on, Kimi Raikkonen out-qualifying and out-classing Sebastian Vettel in qualifying. 
How many times has that actually happened this season? I was waiting for you to bring Kimi Raikkonen in, bring that in the up. picture. Yes, <laughs> yes. Let's go on to the race though. And let's please, please plead that Monza does not go off the calendar. I mean, it's too iconic a race for Formula 1 to lose. And the images of the Grand Prix fans just enjoying the race was just so exciting to see. I wish so too an out-and-out power circuit, a super fan experience. And I wonder that if Bernie can save Lotus by funding them, I wonder why he can't save Monza too. Well, if I ever get to run the sport, you know, just in case, uh-huh, uh-huh. my aim would be to have the scenes from Monza replicated at every single circuit in the world. I mean, it is fan power that drives the sport after all, and Monza did a damn good job. I can see your vote bank politics. <laughs> you have my vote, Miss Mehta. Thank you, indeed. But I can tell you that Bernie Ecclestone probably didn't fund Lotus enough. You know, they came to Monza a little late. They did a decent qualifying. Frankly, they did a good qualifying, actually. Yes. And they parked up in the opening couple of laps in the race itself. You know, I guess that they somewhere overdid their fuel allowance. (laughs) They were hoping for another podium after their brilliant run at Spa. And it's a pity that Monza didn't quite go as per plan. But back to Lewis Hamilton, Kunal. What an amazing race. You know, he just makes it all seem so simple. Yes. So effortless and just so natural. Like, he comes in style, he races in style, he leaves in style... He even parties in style. And well, his new hairstyle. That is very much in style too now. (laughs) And the irony of the situation is that Mercedes now have two blonde drivers in their team. You know, I actually remember now, we'd done a podcast last year, which was, you know, something like Mercedes prefer a blonde on top. And I think Hamilton went and coloured his hair blonde as a reaction to that. A little slow, but <laughs> one of the few times he's been slow, so it's okay. Yes, and I, you know, I, I must admit though that there is something really funny about his hair and something still out of the place at the same time. I, I agree. <laughs> Hamilton's hair has been quite the talk of this podcast. Last episode, we, we called it Hamilton's bad hair days are here to stay. <laughs> and that's flying off shards literally. But but moving on, very, very good to see Felipe Massa on the podium, ahead of Valtteri Bottas. The old man says that he still has some speed left in him, and we're really glad that William thinks so too. I mean, they've confirmed this pair for 2016, so some good racing to look forward to. Yes, and since we're on the topic of the podium, we should talk of the two drivers who probably missed being there, Nico Rosberg and Kimi Raikkonen. We'll just do a bit of go back. Rosberg, older spec engine, expected to be more reliable, but actually wasn't. The luck of the number two, as I call it, struck him. However, I actually didn't expect him to challenge Hamilton this weekend too, despite him saying that he's going to study his onboard shots and telemetry, etc. He needs to be studying a lot more. For Raikkonen, it isn't revealed though whether it was a driver or a car problem that saw him go from, you know, P2 to P20 or thereabouts in just a fraction of a second? You know, I can tell you he was sleeping at the start. (laughs) I wouldn't be surprised. I would actually love to hear the (laughs) post-race radio message from Ferrari's pit wall to Kimi saying, "Um, Kimi, you know, actually the race has started by the way. And I'd also love to hear Kimi's reply to that, (laughs) given his (laughs) epic radio messages. A surprise entry to the top 10 though. Marcus Ericsson, good job on that. Yes. I am so glad that apart from adding two penalty points to his super license, he now has added two points to his driver's championship. You know what? I am most glad that he stayed behind the Force Indias, who scored a super P6 and P7 and added 14 points to their constructors' championship. And on that note, Lotus actually scored nil which means that Force India are back to where they belong. Fifth place in the Constructors' Championship. Woohoo! Good job, Force India. Luckily for Renault and Red Bull, despite missing out on the top 10 in qualifying, they had both their cars finish in the top 10 in the race. Good result, huh? Yes, some saving face. And on that note, Honda, Renault's nearest competitor, or so they believe, had a retirement in Alonso and the interesting part for me this weekend was the visibility of a deeper crack 
in the McLaren Honda relationship. Reports also said that McLaren went back to using a longer nose in Monza. Although you know if you ask me, they'd be more sensible to just go back using the Mercedes engines. <laughs> But given the negative publicity received by Honda and Renault this season, I wonder if they envy Pirelli at the moment. Mm, I know you're getting at Bernie's dicta to gag the drivers from speaking against Pirelli to the media. Yes, you know, if I were Honda and Renault, I would envy their position of preference with Bernie Ecclestone. But that's the difference, you know. Honda and Renault spend on the teams where Bernie makes no money. Whereas Pirelli spends on the sport via sponsorship and trackside advertisements where he actually benefits. From an engine manufacturer's perspective, so Mercedes traded in all their tokens for an upgrade in Monza. What's not known publicly though, if this upgrade was actually available to their customer teams as well. And if not, when can they actually expect this? You know, this is precisely why McLaren left Mercedes. Being a customer team is always different from being a works team. And you know, with this whole Red Bull Racing wanting Mercedes engine scenario, I can tell you that Red Bull Racing is very keenly observing how Mercedes is treating their customers with this new upgrade. I was doing some research on Fernando Alonso. And here's an interesting statistic. So Alonso's faced six retirements already this season, mm -hmm. right? And um, interestingly enough, in his five years with Ferrari, he had only a total of seven retirements. So he's pretty close to equaling his five-year record in one year with McLaren. <laughs> and I think we've said this numerous times before, and so have all the fans, for Alonso, for Button, and for McLaren's sake. Let's really, really hope that McLaren Honda get their act in order, deliver, and deliver fast. Hmm, you know, Alonso faces stiff competition from a very different contender. That is in the form of Pastor Maldonado. <laughs> yes. Pastor Maldonado has 8 DNFs from 12 starts this season. How does he manage that, Kunal? Just how does he do it? He gets a lot of money from PDVSA. That's how he does it. <laughs> I'm just surprised that you prepared it so late to bring Pastor Maldonado into our <laughs> podcast. <laughs> And on that note, that's it from us here, folks, this week. Thank you for tuning in. We really hope that you enjoyed the Italian Grand Prix and possibly enjoyed this episode of the Inside Line Formula 1 podcast a little bit more. See you next week. See you, guys. If you look around, you'll see the world can be pretty smart. Okay, very smart. At Capella University, we think education should be smart too. That's why we're reshaping online learning with our FlexPath format. You can set your own deadlines, take classes at your own pace, even leverage your previous experience to move faster. So when it comes to earning your bachelor's degree, you know what kind of choice to make. A smart one. Visit capella.edu to learn more. Capella University. Don't just learn, learn smarter.